Hi there, my name is George and I help creators launch their products and games with my companies YG and Fantastic Funding. On this podcast, you'll hear from the creators and experts how they consistently launch record-breaking campaigns so you can do the same. My guest today is Brandon McCaskill, studio head at Open Owl Studios, who have launched multiple games, including Stars of Icarios, Mythwind, and Stone Saga, raising over $3 million combined. He also provides weekly crowdfunding advice through a sub stack called The Crowdfunding Coach. So we're very excited to have you. Welcome, Brendan. Hey, thanks for having me, George. Absolutely. So let's start all the way at the beginning. Your first campaign dates back to 2018, according to Kickstarter records. Yeah. So take us back to 2018. How did you get into board game publishing and into crowdfunding? Yeah, and it's not even a game that you listed. You listed the, the three successful ones. Yes, it's not <laughs> unsuccessful, but I we'll, we'll get to that in a second because my sure. next question is going to be, how do you go from a thirty thousand Canadian yeah. dollar campaign to millions? But let's yeah, let's go to that first campaign. So, so what for, did you do for me? Uh, as you mentioned, we we make board games. I make board games, but I, I would probably consider myself like an entrepreneur first, and then like a board game designer second. And so I've been fascinated with Kickstarter from the beginning. I don't know my first project back, but it was years ago, maybe a, a decade or so ago. And I've been toying with different ideas and I was excited to kind of get into the crowdfunding space just because I love the direct connection with the community. And I, it just so happened, whatever, six years ago that the kind of a, a hobby passion of mine of board games kind of aligned with the crowdfunding uh, entrepreneurial kind of style. And then I kind of smashed those together and saw what happened. And it's fun. It was a lot of hard work grinding up that first campaign. You mentioned, yeah, we raised, I think, like $28,000 and uh, I well, learned a ton through the process, but it was, it was fantastic. We go from a campaign that raised 28000 Canadian dollars. Not bad by any stretch. Nope, that, no, that, those are vet, very valid campaigns. But then two, just two short years later, Stars of Icarios raises almost a million Canadian dollars. What happened <laughs> in, in the yeah. meantime? How did you get there? Yeah, pro probably two, two main things. One, Last One Standing was a solo effort. Besides, I hired an artist, like a really cheap artist, but I did everything else myself, graphic design, marketing, just the, the list goes on. And my budget was like relatively limited. I was engaged at the time. And I remember joking with my now wife, I was like, I either spend money on a down payment of a home or I make a board game. And I ended up making a board game. But then kind of after that, I got connected with, uh, with some people in town and specifically this one guy who has a video game history and he's and has founded a few video game studios and he was interested in doing some board game stuff. So really a partnership with him was first and foremost, there's, there's things you can do when you have some cash to play with that you can't do solo, whether it's just higher quality kind of design, artwork, money to spend on advertising. That, so I would say that's one bucket. And then the other bucket for something that kind of, yeah, the 30,000 to the almost a million raise was I think. I had a much better idea of who my market and my target audience was in that second campaign. The first one was just like a little bit of a shot in the dark and it's interested to see who, who showed up, who didn't show up. By the time I went around and did the second campaign for Stars of Icarios, I had a pretty good idea of who uh, the board game market was on Kickstarter. And then being able to take an idea that I was passionate about, but then align that with what I felt that market would like and would be excited. And, and it just so happened that they were, and that kind of started off this trajectory that we're in now. Okay, we need to probe this a little further yeah. because you haven't had just one successful campaign. You have, you've had three increasingly successful campaigns in a row. So one could be luck. Two, you're onto something. Three, you know something that other people don't. Yeah. So what is your recipe for success? What are the steps that you take from the early idea to the last minute of the campaign? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a big question. Also, this is a fun conversation to have today because we just announced our Stars of Icarus 1.5 campaign. So that one went, so that the preview page went live and it's getting followers today. So that's kind of a fun full circle moment. But yeah, so there's a couple of things. I imagine, George, we should have talked a little bit about who your audience is because typically I tailor my audience based off of, based off of who's speaking. And I imagine from your website, it's mostly kind of founders, a little bit more in the tech product space, probably less like kind of creative game designers, hey? Yeah, so typically how we structure this podcast is we, this podcast is category agnostic. So we don't typically 
speak much about the game and the game mechanics itself. We, we talk about more of the entrepreneurial journey and the technicalities of how you set this campaign up. So that's the audience. Perfect. So again, big question, how do we go from idea to, to product launch and to, to the inception of the product? For us, it, it always does start with an idea. And being in the creative space, it tends to be an experience we want to capture around the table, but it really doesn't matter. And whatever the idea is, before any work is done on the project, I set up like a, like a fake Facebook and Instagram accounts, and then I do some A-B testing. And I, we've spent enough money in online marketing in the past to know what good click rates are for our industry. And so I throw out a bunch of copy that I feel sums up the idea. And if people are clicking and giving me their emails, then I know that we're potentially onto something. And so this is really our first step. We, we A-B test our ideas before we do any actual development in it. Can I just zoom in on that for a second? Yeah. So you set up fake accounts. So are those like fake accounts for this game that you're testing? Yeah, typically I, I don't like tying advertisements to our main page because people will see the advertisement and, oh, are you guys making something? So I tend to just run Facebook ads through random pages that people don't have an association with our account. And it really is just to test the idea itself. So it's just to see whether or not people will respond on the image or the idea. I typically just use stop art. I always buy some stock cards and then, and then that, that I feel like captures it. And if people are clicking on the copy, then it's good. If, if it's not, then, then we don't kind of continue to the next step. And this determines whether or not you even want to move forward with the game itself. Yeah. So what's interesting about this, and then we'll continue on to the next steps, because I know I'm stopping you. It's like step zero. No, that's, that's okay. It's great. What's interesting to me about this is that basically you're say, you're not saying if people don't like playing this game, I'm not going to do it, but you're saying if ads for this game don't yeah. work. And so I think that recognizes the importance that ads and, and digital marketing play in the success of this, because if it, people can love the game, but if the ads don't work, you're still not moving forward. Yeah. And for us, we're a crowdfunding first platform. So we do a bulk of our sales through crowdfunding and I, we have good designers and developers and I'm confident we can get many ideas to a place of being fun and interesting and unique. But if that core idea doesn't resonate with our audience, there's no reason to dump thousands of dollars into it. We take the idea, if, if we have good product market fit, then we move on to the next stage. We spend a lot of money on art, on all the development. But I think one, one key thing that is transcendent of genre on Kickstarter is we launch our preview page for our, for our crowdfunding campaign really early. And there's a couple of things for this. There's, there's probably a few different ways that I would say the traditional way of doing the preview page is like a landing page on your own website where you can start to generate email so you can do follow-up stuff. And I think that works quite well, especially if you have a limited budget and, and you're hoping to capture the sale sometime along the journey. But we do a, a, something a little bit different because in our industry on Kickstarter specifically, the board game, we have a high rate of conversion on followers. So as, as much as it pains me to not capture the customer's information, we send them directly to our Kickstarter page, to the Kickstarter preview page. And we do that because what you're talking about is we've run a couple campaigns. And so I'm confident that I can get between a 20 and 30% conversion on the follower number, which I think is high in Kickstarter in general. That's pretty average in our industry for a campaign that, that, that does well. Um, and so, so I know that I get the highest rate of return just sending them to our preview page. And we start that out, like, as soon as we're ready, we throw that live. So we're collecting emails, we're doing paid advertisements specifically through Facebook, Google ads and Instagram. We see the most kind of return on, on like the meta ads. Um, and, and yeah, so, so we're live, we're rocking and rolling from, from the beginning on that. Um, because, you know, for us, it's generating hype and Another thing that is unique in the kind of board game space is the first three days of the campaign are like crucially important. We do, I think, 70% of our funding in the first three days, which is wild. I know there's an espresso machine on Kickstarter like a month or two ago. It was an incredible espresso machine. But one of the, if you know, all the Kickstarter or crowdfunding people out there, go watch it, uh, Kickstarter espresso. And the reason why it had, it was called meticulous. Yeah, meticulous espresso. By far the best 
crowdfunding video I've ever seen. But the agency that they hired is top notch. It probably cost them a couple hundred thousand dollars just to do that video. But I'm not too sure on their crowdfunding journey. I imagine it's a little bit of a slower burn and in more traditional markets. But for us, those first couple of days, we want to capture as many sales. And we find that the best way of doing that is with the preview page. And it's mostly because our audience has been conditioned. The board game audience has been conditioned yeah. uniquely on Kickstarter. On that audience, when you do your targeting for meta ads, do you target previous backers of your own campaign? So like custom audiences, or do you also just do broad interests of people into tabletop plus a match with Kickstarter? Yeah. So it, it's a mixture, right? We do we do our custom audiences based off of our mailing list. We do the lookalike audiences based off of those. And then we also do what you suggest and board game plus Kickstarter. And then we target the, the market and then we'll just, we'll feed. We spend a lot of money on marketing because we're confident in the conversion. Uh, anytime there's a new, there's a new entrepreneur, a new crowd funder, I'm always hesitant to be like, hey, go spend a lot of money because ad spend, if you don't know what you're doing, can be like a quick way to lose a lot of money really quick. <laughs> but if you are confident in return, you can, you know, you can get a, a, a really high return. At least we, we see typically our, our pre Kickstarter, pre crowdfunding ad spend ROAS is like, like we hover around a 10, which is like insane. Like good ro good ROAS is like four typically. And this is where we're at when it's like during campaign. But for some reason, our pre campaign ROAS, it's just, it's astronomical. And I'm not too sure why I'm, I'm not complaining. But it is kind of, it is what it is, so. Yeah, please don't jinx the meta gods. If the algorithm yeah. is in your favor, don't question it. <laughs> so you're really good at your pre-launch campaign. You get 70% of your funding in your first couple of days. That last 30%, what is that? Is that Kickstarter organic traffic? Is that ads when you're live? Yeah, it's a combination of all those things. So we partner with like a lot of content creators in our space, really saying YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, all that content. Just so if there's a steady stream of new content, I, I think we probably spend more there than we should. There's a lot of overlap in the channels that we end up using. I don't know how large those audiences are, but we do that. So we see some organic growth through Kickstarter, not as much as we used to, I feel. So I'm not too sure what's going on there, but we still see there's some networking effects on Kickstarter, which is nice. And then, and then we are running ads as well. And those are just standard Google and Facebook ads to generate sales. But it's always a slog. The middle of the campaign, it's, it's, it doesn't matter how big of a campaign, how small of a campaign you are. It's just, it's a slog. If you like look on any of the campaign trackers, it's like, and it's always painful. So. And I think another thing that's really difficult to know in terms of your data is when you do this pre-launch strategy with a lot of people that like notify me on launch from Kickstarter, do that look in your Kickstarter dashboard the amount of backers that Kickstarter reports is coming from Kickstarter yeah. include those people. And that's not accurate, obviously, because you drove them there. And I'm not sure exactly how Kickstarter tracks some of those things. Like, it's a little bit of a black box, I think, that conversion yeah. follower stuff. Because I'm like, I feel like I've, it's never sat like 100% well with me. I'm like, oh, it's working, but I'm like, there's something missing here in the analytics. I know they've opened up like advanced dashboards. So I, I haven't launched a campaign since they have, and I'm interested to try that out. I think as a general rule of thumb, having your Google analytics run side yeah. by side with the Kickstarter analytics is a good choice, even though it, that data ultimately also comes from a Kickstarter, but it's definitely good to have that run side by side. It is a bit of a black box. I, I definitely think that your hunch is correct, that there is a little bit of over-reporting, especially when it comes to that notification sequence. Like it's hard to unpack yeah. where people come from, yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, so I feel like we have some really good steps as to how you go from an early idea, which you A-B test with, with fake or unbranded accounts, then you run ads. Some are emails, a majority of them are going to your Notify Me on launch page, 70% of your funding comes from those pre-launch efforts. And then the remaining 30% is a mix of Kickstarter traffic, organic, some ads, and some influencers. So that, that's a campaign for you. Yeah. That brings us to 100%. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Then I want to move on from Kickstarter for a minute because you recently started a Substack newsletter called The Crowdfunding Coach, which is very awesome. It will be linked in the show notes. And in a recent article, you talk about Kickstarter versus GameFound, uh, because GameFound has gained a lot of traction recently. 
before we dive into that comparison, what I find a little bit awkward is that you are not even considering Backerkit in this comparison, even though Backerkit has been around for about as long as Kickstarter. They have launched their own crowdfunding platform as well. Yet the conversation is about GameFound and Kickstarter. What do you feel is missing from Backerkit that makes you not even consider it in an article? Hey, I have friends at Backerkit. So if you're listening, I still do love you. So I, I, Gloomhaven, if you've ever heard of Gloomhaven and Frosthaven, I think two of the most funded campaigns ever on Kickstarter. So like sig significant, raised millions and millions and millions of dollars. There's a Gloomhaven campaign, I don't know if you knew this, on Backerkit right now. And it's called Gloomhaven Grand Festival. It's raised 1.6 million. And this it's only been online for a day and a bit. 6,700 backers in two days. So good on them. They're going to hit their funding goal. They have a really high funding goal. I, I don't know what happened. Like for me, this is maybe I'm looking at it. I'm like, okay, this is maybe a third of what they, where they should be. I don't know if this is like macroeconomic. It's not I, good like, though. It's not good. No, no, not for, no. not for. So I was comparing it to our Mifflin numbers and not the dollar value because dollar value is one thing. I was comparing it to our backer numbers. In the first two days of Mythwin's campaign, we ended up with, we had 5,400 bathers in two days. Compared to Gloomhaven, we're nobody. We're somebody in the bigger sphere, but compared to Gloomhaven, we're nobody. So the fact that we could track, we could be on par with them in the terms of number of backers, I'm like, okay, something's wrong there. And just because of that, and it's also not like public, like the their crowdfunding campaign isn't public. That's just why I don't talk about it. That's all. I use them. I hire them for my marketing services. So yeah. thanks, guys. It's awkward because this is not to rip on back kid or anything. It's really, it's interesting to me because I think, again, they have been around for so long. They have so much data. So many people have a back kid account. I think when they announced crowdfunding by back kid, that was a bigger shock to Kickstarter, I feel, than when just GameFound came along. Because I feel like with back kid, the call came from inside the house almost, right? Like they have been... Backerkit was one of the only companies that have access or had access to Kickstarter's elusive API that does exist, but is for no one but Backerkit and a few other companies. And I feel it was a real shock to the system, but it has not caught as much tailwinds, I feel, as GameFound. So I also don't know what's going on there. That's why I was interested to hear if you have any thoughts. For me, I think it's feature set. So we're actually using GameFound for our new Stars Macarios one. It's interesting. Main reason is I don't feel that Kickstarter offers me enough in the terms of organic growth in order to, like, we, we drive most of our traffic through ad spend. And if you're a smaller company and you're relying on that organic growth, then 100% stay on Kickstarter. But for us, I don't think it matters as much. And I could be eating my words in a couple of months after we run our campaign. That's okay. But the features that GameFound offers, it's unbelievable. Like I've been asking Kickstarter, for, so we're Canadians. I've been asking Kickstarter for years to, for the ability to run a campaign in US dollars. Like, I don't think Americans understand how important that is. We have to run, you go on one of our Kickstarter pages and we, you'll see a US dollar listed and then a Canadian dollar listed. We lose a couple percent every time we convert funds back and over. But we also have to pay our vendors in American, right? So. It's that for me is just, I will be using Kickstarter in the future, like our next Mythwin launch, but it, it just really drives me insane. And I like Everett, the new CEO. I think he understands that he even mentioned that Kickstarter, what do you say? It was a stagnant company. I think he said, even though it was like a new company, he mentioned that it was stagnant and that it needs to grow. And I'm like, okay, good. You see that I, nothing against unions. I just think that sometimes unions slow things way down. And so maybe I'm reading into something there, but there's been no love for the board game community on Kickstarter up until recently. And there's still very little love. And we do what, 30, 40% of Kickstarter sales. I think something crazy like that. So I went on a little bit of a rant there. I love Kickstarter and the opportunities it's given me, but the fact of the feature growth being so slow has been pretty wild. You're not the first person to say this, and I think everyone agrees. It's Kickstarter sometimes feel like we love Kickstarter, but Kickstarter doesn't love itself. And also, I think what's just a hard thing for GameFound is for game creators. So they just need to hear you say this thing 
about the dollar thing and whatnot, and they can just implement it because it's probably the same for all the creators on there. But Kickstarter obviously serves all categories in the world, right? Like people wanting to raise for a film, for this, for that. And so building something for everyone also means building something for no one. And I think that's also where a lot of those, they get this feedback from the gaming community, but then what if they implement that and it turns out to be a horrible decision for comics for whatever reason. And so that is, I think, to Kickstarter's defense, difficulty. Yeah, Uh, there's things like GameFound is offering stretch pay, which is pretty neat. We're going to be using that. I don't think here, the biggest threat to the Kickstarter platform is actually the creators themselves. Like that's the biggest threat because I don't, at least in, in our little industry, there's been an implosion of board game companies over promising and under delivering or just not delivering at all or selling the game and then asking people for another 50% so that they can ship it across. And that happens in a lot of campaigns, not just board games. There's been so many, I, I think I still have a few outstanding like tech campaigns. And it's like, oh, whatever money's gone. <laughs> but it, it's interesting because Kickstarter is not incentivized to worry about that. Right? They're incentivized to prop up big campaigns and big creators and at the expense of their customer and their customers, the backer. And so it's really a question of incentivization right now. And there is no, as long as backers keep on returning, if they have a policy that you can have no more than three, three outstanding campaigns, but they just launched a, a public partnership with, was it Steamforge? And I think Steamforge has six outstanding campaigns right now or something like that. And this isn't, I, right, this isn't to be a rail on Kickstarter, but I'm here. I'm trying to like diligently manage our finances and we don't charge, we haven't charged our backers anything extra. We launched like the day the pandemic like shut down the world. We launched Stars of Icarios and we suffered the 4000 to $20,000 container increase and we took that, right? So we've done all those things and it's, man. It's hard because I have a lot of backers who don't want to keep on backing because they've just been burnt by so many different people. So that's a tough one. One of the things that I've always noticed, both internally and externally at Kickstarter, is that Kickstarter relies a lot on individual relationships with the outreach leads. So it's like there's a set of rules that is general for all creators, but if you have some sort of relationship with Kickstarter, whether it being this new announced public one, or just a really good relationship with the outreach lead that trusts you, they can overwrite some of the rules that are for everyone. And although that seems like a good thing in that, if you're that specific creator that has that relationship, it creates this really weird thing for everyone else who doesn't know why the rules are applied to some folks and aren't applied to others. And then they're not being open about that. So I think it like, It comes from a really good place because when I was an outreach lead, I did the exact same thing, right? Like I would meet with a creator face to face and hold their prototypes in my hand and go to their office and see the legitness of it firsthand. So I would go to the trust and safety team and be like, can you expedite the review process? Because I'm literally like here with them right now. I'd show trust and safety like on my phone. And then, and so it's, then it's very nice that they're able to say, yeah, we'll expedite that process. But then no one sees that on the backer side. And so then it just creates these weird friction moments where people are like, why? I heard Everett say in a different talk I heard the other day, he is actually looking into sort of some of these processes internally because he also sometimes looks at projects is what he said. And he's like, I don't understand why this is project we love and that isn't, right? And I think that also comes back to this sort of personal relationship. It's because you email the right person, which it's so bad. I love Kickstarter, but it just, it's so confusing to me. Like I email someone and I get a badge and I'm like, okay, let's, anyways, sorry, George. I'm, I didn't mean to take this over in the Kickstarter gripe session. We can keep on talking about no, that. It's, <laughs> no, it's not, but I think it's really good. And I think it's really honest. And also I feel like with Everett, it, this is not like bashing Kickstarter. I think this is just being really productive. And I think this is why it's good that there's game found because if there's only one player in the market, they don't really have to improve. And I think just because of GameFound's existence and rise, people are having these conversations and it will only make the platform better. And that just serves the whole community. And I'm optimistic about Kickstarter's future. Like I want it to succeed. If you were the CEO of Kickstarter or GameFound, which five features would you push immediately? I would purchase Backerkit. 
that would be step number one. I don't know if they're available for purchase, but I would raise the cash and make an offer because they're literally leaving 30 to 50% extra revenue on the table. I know they made this informal partnership with, or this formal partnership with Pledge Manager. Nothing against Pledge Manager, but it's the worst of the three. It's, yeah, and it's the worst of the three, right? If you look at GameFound, BackerKit, or Pledge Manager and purchase or, or buy Pledge Manager, bake it in, what it, whatever it is. Uh, so step one, integrate a Pledge Manager because uh, a hangup for Kickstarter for the average Joe is why do I have to buy something on Kickstarter and then go somewhere else and do a Pledge Manager and then pay for it, right? So okay, we, we don't need to do that. We can capture it all in one place. Do it. That's one. Two, I would integrate some accountability for creators. I'm not too sure what that would look like, but I think we need to have some accountability for creators. And whether that's Kickstarter ponying up, hey, we're going to we're going to back your pledge. If we say this is a trusted creator and they fall through, we got your back. And that's tough because I know Kickstarter doesn't make a ton of money. 5% isn't crazy on the revenue they do, but uh, some accountability. I'm trying to think of other features. Obviously, I'm complaining about currency. There's a bunch of quality of life stuff. Their editor is like from the 90s, sorry, early 2000s. And it's, it hasn't changed since, I don't know, I, maybe they've done one thing to it. But if you upload a picture, it's still sent you to the top of the page when you're doing the descriptions. And for us people with long pages, then you have to scroll all the way down and it's a mess. So there's a handful. Everett, if you're listening, please fix it and subscribe to the crowdfunding coach yeah, sure. uh, on Substack yeah. for great tips. What's the new thing and where can people go to subscribe? Yeah. So I, as I mentioned, you're welcome to search Stars Bacardus on, on GameFound. We'll be there. It's a new campaign. You mentioned the Substack. That's great. Really, that's just where I'm at. We have our Facebook groups and our Discord groups. If you're interested to learn more or openlstudios.com, you can find us on our website, our games, if you're interested in kind of learning more about we got these big like movies in a box is kind of how I describe it to people. So lots of artwork, lots of story, lots of game. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Perfect. All the links mentioned are in the description. If so, if you're in your podcast player right now, just go into the description. You can click everything. Brendan, thank you so much for your time. I, I think it's been a really good candid discussion and uh, best of luck with everything. And let us know what if you launch on GameFound, let's have you back on the pod and hear how that experience was. Yeah, let's hope it's a good one. For sure. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you so much.